Hey, welcome to uh, the Rooted Bible Study series. This year, this semester, we're going through the book of Ephesians, and I am so honored that I've been asked to be a part of this. Um, my name is Brad Martin. I'm the worship pastor here at Northside, and so uh, we're, we're going to get an opportunity to look at Ephesians chapter 2. And um, when I found out that Libby and the team were going to take the ladies uh, through this book, I was so excited because this is one of my favorite books of the Bible. And I'm excited because I get to be a part of the first uh, half of, of Ephesians. Uh, something that we need to know about Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. This is where Paul, as he's writing to the church at Ephesus, he is just unpacking doctrine. He's unpacking who God is and how are we to respond to him. And then when you get to 4, 5, and 6, what he's doing, he's building a case then for how we are to live out what we believe. And so today, as we look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, um, we're going to look at these passages, and I hope and pray that we'll be able to see what life is like in Christ, that we become alive in Christ. Now, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. He's describing what it means to receive salvation. He's describing what it means to be a part of, the, of Christ's body, the church. And he goes through this, this wonderful letter of, through the process of salvation, and he draws upon all these incredible theological, uh, doctrinal uh, positions that will, are supposed to encourage us as believers, but at the same time, let us know how great our God is. So here's the big idea that I want to unpack today, and I hope you write this down uh, as you're looking through Ephesians chapter 2. Coming alive in Christ can be accomplished by the power of God because of His love and His mercy. So we're going to look at verses 1 through 3 at first. I'm going to break this down and kind of have some, some uh, an outline you know, that you can write down. But the first thing I want you to know right here is that we are saved from sin. Okay, We're saved from sin. Now, where do we get that? We get that in the first three verses. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So right here we see that that's what we're saved from. We're saved from sin. That which Paul describes in verses 1 through 3, that was our life before Christ. It's a very clear statement of the sinfulness of man. And that's what Paul wants us to be aware of and to remind us of, of how sinful our nature is. We read also in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, uh, Paul's magnum opus of his writings. He tells us that the wages of sin is death, the penalty, the payment of sin, it's death. And because we were born into that sin, if there wasn't a change, wasn't a transaction um, for our sin, we would remain in death and ultimately never have life, never experience life in Christ, never experience a spiritual life. We would stay in death and walk this earth in death. Now, we don't become spiritually dead because we sin. We're spiritually dead because by nature, as Paul says, we are sinful. That's the condition of the human heart. Every human that ever walked this earth, except for Christ, because Christ was human and fully divine as well, every human since the fall has walked in death and by nature been born dead. Now, you can look at a dead person and you can see a dead person. There's no movement there. And that dead person is unable to respond to stimulus. A, a dead person cannot react. There's no longer a response to light or sound or smell or taste or pain. And that is what happens with the spiritual death as well. A person who is spiritually dead has no life in them and they're not able to respond to anything. A spiritually dead person is what he's saying is alienated, separated from God, and therefore it's a case of death walking. Humans apart from God are like spiritual zombies walking this earth with death in them. Before they are saved, before we are saved, we're like every other person who's apart from God. And Paul says we are dead in our trespasses and sins. 
We are not dead because we've committed sin, but we are dead because we are in sin. We were born into sin. In this context, the word trespasses and sins, it does not refer to acts, but first of all, to the sphere of existence of the person apart from God. That's the existence, is that we're, we're trespassing, we're walking along, we're in sin, we're in death. And in this state of spiritual death, the only walking or living that a person can do, according to what Paul says in verse 1 through 3, is according to the course of this world, according to the prince or the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Paul makes very clear the course of this world follows the leadership and the design of Satan, who is the prince of the power of the air. Satan is the prince or the ruler of this world. And to walk according to that course of this world, according to that power, is to think and to live according to the uh, ideologies and the standards of which Satan has control over and dominion over the evil supernatural beings. And Paul wants us to see how unsaved people live and to remind all believers how we ourselves were like them. We were formerly like them. We walked like them. We lived like them. We talked like them. We thought like them. And therefore, if we now have new life in Christ, if we are alive in Christ, if we've been saved, there should be a dramatic change. We should no longer want to live or to act or to talk like those who are uh, walking the, the discourse of this world. All of us we used to live in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And by nature, that's our nature. We were children of wrath. Even as we rest, it says, all of us were once totally consumed and lost in the system of the world. But because of Christ's work of salvation on the cross and what he did for us and in us, we are now presently and eternally under his love and delivered from the human condition of death. So right there in those three verses, he just, just tries to unpack that we are saved from sin. The second thing I want you to know, and this is where we'll, we, we can um, press on even further, is that we're saved by his love. Look at verse 4. I love what verse 4 says. But God. you got to circle or underline those two words right there. It says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Right there, let's stop right there. He says, we are saved from sin. We are saved by his love. And Paul tells us that it's because of God's rich mercy. His rich mercy is overbounding. It's without measure. It's unlimited. And those two words, but God, show us where the initiative took place. It was God. You know, you read verses 1 through 3. It talks about how sinful we were and how awful and, 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 and vile and wretched we are. But God did not want to leave us that way. God's great desire for all of mankind is that we would be rejoined with him because he created us in his own image for his glory. And because of his rich love and his mercy towards us and his great love towards us, God provided a way for you and I to return to him. And we know that that way is only through Jesus Christ. What I love about these passages is that God reminds us that he says, I will reach out to the most vile, the most sinful, the most depraved, destitute, and condemned people, and I'm going to offer them salvation. I'm going to offer them a way to salvation, and I'm going to offer them eternal blessings. So when you think about it, our rebellion that we once lived in, it's not only against God's lordship and love, but it's also against God's love. How can you imagine someone to experience or know or hear about the love of God so much and they still want to rebel that? They still want to reject that? Well, that's our nature. That's, our, that's what, how we were born into. But the good news is this, is that God sees us and he has so much compassion and love for us that he does not want to leave us in that state. So he makes a way for us to come out of that. And that's through salvation in Jesus Christ, through the finished work of, of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection. And so now it shows us that we are saved by God's love. Number three, I want you to write this down. We're also saved into new life. We're saved into new life. Look at verse five. Verse five says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. 
So now Paul is saying, above all, a dead person needs to be made alive again. And that is what salvation gives us. New life. Spiritual life. He's writing this to encourage believers who doubt the power of Christ. Paul is reminding us that if God is so powerful to save you from that dead state, God is powerful enough to sustain you in this new life in Christ. The power that raised us out of sin and death is the same power that makes us alive together with Christ. And it continues to energize the Christian life forever. When we become Christ followers, we're no longer alienated from God. We're no longer alienated from this life of God. We now become spiritually alive through the union with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for the rest of our lives. And now we can become sensitive to God and his promptings in our life. Paul calls this, if you look at Romans chapter 6, verse 4, this is walking in newness of life. We're no longer walking in death. We're no longer walking in darkness. But because of Christ, because we've been saved, we are now walking in newness of life. We're walking in a new light. And for the first time, now we can understand spiritual truth. And now we can have this desire, this longing in our hearts for spiritual things. Because now we have God's nature living in us. We now seek godly things, not earthly, worldly things. We're seeking godly things. Paul describes it as things of above, spiritual things. Being alive together with Christ, that is the result of salvation. We're saved from our sin. We're saved by his love. We're saved into new life. And number four, write this down. I love this part. We're getting to some good stuff. We are saved with a purpose. God has a purpose of salvation. It's a twofold purpose. We're going to see that in verses 6 and 7 of Ephesians 2. And Paul says, And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So, salvation has a purpose in regard to us and also in regards to God. It's a twofold purpose. The most direct result of salvation is for us to be raised up with him and to be seated with him in the heavenly places. Yes, we were dead to sin, but because of Christ, now we are alive to Christ and alive to righteousness through the resurrection in which we are raised. But we can also enjoy his exaltation and his preeminent glory. Now, we are citizens of heaven through Christ. When Paul says that we are seated, that is a, a word that he uses very particular there. He wants us to know that the seated position is an absolute position. It's a seated position that no one can take you out of. In the back of my truck, I've got a, a car seat. And it's locked in uh, to the seat, uh, through the car seat. There's, there's buckles and there's straps and there's locks. And it's locked down here. It's locked up top. And I put Lottie in there. I put her in and I lock her here and I lock her down there. I mean, she is seated in there and there's no way that she can get out. It is a permanent promise that Paul is telling us that when you're seated with Christ, nothing can remove you from that position. Paul says, that we've been seated with him. It's an absolute promise to be seated in God's dominion and not Satan's. So why are we saved? He says also in order that now here's God's greater purpose. Here's the second part of, of the purpose of salvation. It's for God's own sake. In order that in the coming ages he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's for our benefit, yes, but it's also for God's benefit to glorify God, to exalt God, to show our friends, our family, and the world how great our God is. It's to display the surpassing riches of His grace. Through God's endless kindness toward us in Christ, Jesus the Father glorifies Himself and He blesses us at the same time. That's that twofold purpose of salvation. I want you to think about this for a moment. Think about this, this, uh, this, this, from the moment of salvation, from the moment that you were saved, 
throughout the ages to come, we never stop receiving the grace and kindness of God. Isn't that something just to be thankful for, to stop and say, God, thank you that I can continually receive your grace. I can continually receive your kindness. Why can we know that? Because Paul says we're seated. We are, we are strapped down in the place where Christ designed for us to be for, throughout all of eternity. And now we can receive his blessing, receive his kindness, receive his grace from God that's never taken away from us. So the purpose of salvation is so that we can receive those blessings, but also so that God will be exalted so that the coming ages, people throughout all of eternity will know how great our God is. Number five, write this down. We are also saved through faith. We're saved through faith. We get this. This is kind of the uh, one of the climax of, of, of this, this, this portion of Scripture. Verses 8 and 9 says this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, not a result of your works, so that no one may boast. So our response in salvation is faith. Not of ourselves, but it is the gift of God. God gives us the gift of faith. It's nothing we can do to receive or earn salvation. Faith is nothing that we do in our own power or in our own resources. We don't have that. We don't have adequate power or adequate resources to receive salvation. Remember at the beginning of this chapter, Paul says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. A dead person cannot respond. So it is a gift. It's a gift of grace. And when we receive that gift of grace, then we have the faith enough to believe. Salvation, it's not about our works, but the finished work of Christ, excuse me, the finished work of God through Christ on the cross. That's the gift of God. We are alive by faith. We can we, we live by faith each and every day. When you woke up this morning, you had faith that your, your coffee pot would, would work. When you got in the car, you had faith that your car would, would turn over and get you safely to work or wherever you're going. When you're driving, you have faith that if you drive over that bridge, that bridge is going to hold you and support you. We live by faith when we put our money in a bank and we have faith and we trust that that bank is going to hold our money and keep it secure. We all live by faith. The only thing we can do that will have any part of salvation is to exercise that faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us. When we accept it, the finished work of Christ, that's when we act by faith. And that is supplied by God's grace. That's His gift to us. It's His gift to, uh, to us out of grace. I heard uh, someone say this, Faith is breathing the breath that God's grace supplies. Faith is breathing the breath that God's grace supplies, reminding us that human effort has nothing to do with salvation. Now, why does Paul make that such a, a, a major point in this verse? Well, I think it's because Paul wants us to come to the cross humble, not boastful. Paul wants us to know that we don't save ourselves. It is God and the power of salvation and His greatness, His love, His mercy, His richness, His kindness, His, His grace towards us. That's what saves us. Christ on the cross. We did nothing out of this. So as a, a saved person, a person walking in new life, walking in new light, we don't walk around boastful, uh, you know, strutting around like, look what I can do. We walk around boasting in God. We walk around boasting and, and pointing people to God in the finished work of Christ on the cross. That's what Paul is trying to get us uh, to, to believe here in the church. And then lastly, number six, we're almost done. You guys are doing great. We're working through this pretty quickly. We're saved for good works. Now that word for is important. We're saved for good works. We're not saved by good works. We're saved for good works. And we get this, we see this in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 2. For we are his workmanship. I want you to underline or circle that word workmanship. We're going to come back to it. It's one of my favorite words in this, this chapter. For we is, are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So even though 
We have no part in gaining salvation. Good works have a great deal to do with us living out our salvation. No good works can produce salvation, but many good works come from our salvation. And before we can do good works for the Lord, He has to do a good work in us. And that good work is saving us from our sinful state. Uh, breathing life into us so a dead man can now become uh, alive in Christ. And by God's grace, we were made effective through our faith. We become his workmanship, his workmanship that was created in Christ Jesus for good works. So the same power that created us in Christ Jesus, that same power that lives with us, it empowers us to do good works for the redeemed. For those for which he redeemed. So Paul is not showing Christ's followers how to be saved, but now he is saying that because you're saved, in order to convince others that you are saved, you must live out this new life in Christ through good works. These good works are expected because God, it says here in, in, in verse 10, he prepared those good works beforehand so that we may walk in them. And that is why James 2, and I know we just... Uh, in our Bible study, we just went through James. James 2 says, faith is illegitimate if works are not present. They go hand in hand. So I love how Paul describes who we are in Christ. He says, we are God's workmanship. That comes from the Greek word poema, or the word that we might see, the English word poem. We are God's poem. We are God's literature masterpiece. We are his literary masterpiece that he created us so that we might live in good works. Before time began, God designed you and me to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. I heard a story one time of a rowdy uh, little kid in, in a Sunday school class, and he was disruptive every Sunday. He was cutting up every Sunday. He was, you know, being the class clown. And one morning, his teacher looked at him and said, Why do you act like that? Don't you know who made you? And the little boy responded, Yeah, God did, but he ain't through with me yet. And I say all that to say is because even now, we're still imperfect. We're not perfected. The only time that we're going to be perfected is when we go to heaven and we experience that glorified state in Christ uh, when, when Christ raises us uh, from this life into eternal life. We are still uncut diamonds being finished by the divine master craftsman. God is not finished with you. God's not finished with me. Therefore, we should not be finished working out our salvation, working out our faith for Christ by sharing Christ's love with other people, by, by walking in this new life, reflecting Jesus Christ everywhere we turn. God's not done with us. And if God's not done with you, God's not through with you, God still has a plan for you and for me, and that we might live in that life living out these good works that God prepared for beforehand. And you may not know all those good works right now. That's why we study the scriptures, we, we read the Bible, we, we pray, we ask God to fill us with this new life each and every day so that we might walk with Him and, and, and worship Him and live with Him. And, and salvation is not just knowing the truth about God, about Jesus Christ, but it's knowing intimately who Jesus is what he's done for us, and how he wants us to live. And now that we are alive in Christ, we can live for him through the power of God because of his love, his mercy, and his kindness. So we just quickly went through 10 verses of just kind of the 30,000 foot of uh, view of Ephesians chapter 2. And I hope and pray that as you continue your study this week, that you'll dive even deeper into what Paul wants us to see through Ephesians chapter 2. So I want to pray for us right now, and then when I get done praying, we can uh, just continue to, to walk with Christ and live that new life with Christ each and every day, okay? Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for um, all of these ladies that have gathered together to work through Ephesians, to work through right now Ephesians chapter 2. I thank you, God, that you empowered Paul to write these scriptures to the church at Ephesus, but also to us today. 
so that we might know who you are and how great you are and what you've done in our life. And Father, I pray that we might humble ourselves each and every day to the power of salvation, to the power of new life in Christ. And God, create in us good works, new works, so that we can live them out for your glory and for the good of the church. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us for Ephesians chapter 2. Hope you have a great week.